So it's very important to make a distinction between the space in which these objects are embedded. That's a term, that's a technical term, and the space that is confined within these objects or the space that is embodied within these objects. So that's why we have two correct answers to this question. So if we speak about the dimensionality of the space in which they are embedded, that space is three-dimensional, and therefore the geometry of these objects is three-dimensional. And yet if we divert our attention to the space that is embedded or embodied in these objects themselves, those spaces are one-dimensional in the case of the objects at the left, two-dimensional in the case of the objects in the middle, and three-dimensional in the case of the objects on the right. Yeah? And since the course is about spatial computing, it's very important that you get a very solid understanding of this concept. So topologically speaking, we say that these objects are uh, one-dimensional objects, and these objects are two-dimensional objects, and these objects are three-dimensional. But as at the same time, they're all three-dimensional objects in the geometric sense of the word. And this brings us to a concept that I will talk about it more even in the next lecture, which is about topology and geometry. And that concept is, is called a manifold space, a space that may look complex in a, in a global sense. So this object doesn't really look like a two-dimensional plane as a whole. But if you can imagine yourself uh, being very, very small and living on this surface, and this surface being very, very huge, you can, you can imagine that you can draw two-dimensional maps about your surrounding space on this surface. And that at the same time, the whole object as a big object doesn't look like a two-dimensional plane. And that is exactly the concept of a manifold. The manifold is an object that is similar to what we call a Euclidean space of a low dimension, locally, but globally, it does not look like that simple object. So there's some complexity about the manifold and there's something simple about the local neighborhoods of points on a, on a space. Uh, I will talk about this point much more in the, in, the, in the next lecture, which is about geometry. But for now, just focus on, on this question. What do we mean when we say a curve drawn in 3D space, not fitting even on a plane? For example, a helix is a one-dimensional space. So if you can imagine yourself moving on a helix, on a curve like this, or on a helix, or any other three-dimensional curve, then you can think of dimensionality as, as the, the number of directions in which you can move freely. So if you are on a curve, or if you can imagine an ant or a very small animal living in a tube, the the poor animal can only go forward and backward. So the life of that animal is going to be very one dimensional in that sense. So it's about movement in general, right? However, when you are on this surface, then at every point on the surface, it appears that you have at least two directions to, to choose your movement from. There can be more than two directions, but uh, this concept of two dimensions pertains to the fact that with only two vectors, you can reproduce all other directions at every local position on this surface. That is called linear independence. We can talk about it more if you have questions about this concept. But for now, just uh, accept the fact that for the same reason that uh, in all kinds of maps that we make from the world, there's a kind of a rectang rectangular representation of space. We are usually talking about the surface of the planet Earth. And for that same reason that we have latitude and longitude and X and Y, then we can think of this as a two-dimensional space, at least locally everywhere two-dimensional. And then also imagine a, a fly flying inside this object, inside the space confined within this object. I'm not talking about the surface of this object. The space inside this object is, is a three-dimensional space. Yeah? While at the same time, the surface of the object or the boundary of the object is two-dimensional. That also brings us to another point, which is uh, another concept, which is called a boundary representation. So pay attention to this fact that we can distinguish these objects by their boundaries as well. So the boundary of this three-dimensional object is a two-dimensional surface. And the boundaries of this two-dimensional object uh, are one-dimensional curves. 
and the boundaries of this one dimensional object, if any, is going to be a zero dimensional point. Okay. This is quite a mouthful, so let's leave it for the next lecture, but this is the, the geeky definition of what we call a manifold. A, a manifold object is geometrically embedded in a higher dimensional space, but the object itself everywhere locally is topologically homeomorphic or similar to a lower dimensional object. That is a general definition of manifold object. And the question why we bother, we have to bother with such definitions is um, about getting more serious with the concept of space. So loosely speaking, a, math, uh, a mathematical representation of a space can tell us where things are or could be and how things can move about their locations within that space. So two things. This one is the more geometric sense of the, the word space, but more importantly, we have to also get into the topological definition of a space, which will be the subject of the next lecture. Okay, so those definitions are now applied to these objects. So this is a two-dimensional surface. That means that the space inside this object everywhere resembles or is similar to a two-dimensional Euclidean space. And that should bring about immediately the question, what on earth is a Euclidean space, right? And that's exactly the question I'm getting into. But before that, just as a reference, if um, our ancestors usually believed that the earth is flat, I would not blame them so much because the scale of the earth is so huge as compared to the scale of the life of a human being that it can be easily assumed that wherever we go, we can have a perfectly two-dimensional conception of our space. And that's why these rectangular maps are so popular all around the world. So much so that our ancestors even believed that the whole earth is flat, right? And there are still people who believe in conspiracy theories. They think that the whole earth is flat and all the things we hear about the, the earth being a planet and so on is uh, are lies from the media and so on, right? Um, anyhow, so these are so far continuous uh, concepts from let's say um, a field in mathematics that is called calculus and and uh, concepts about topology in the sense of point set topology that have most uh, mostly continuous connotations of the, uh, when it comes to defining um, the notion of a space. However, in practice, in computational practice, we have to work with uh, the so-called discrete representation of representations of space. And here you can see two generic and um, exemplary approaches to defining spaces in a discrete sense. One is using irregular meshes and the other one is using regular meshes or regular networks or grids. They're better known as grids. And these representations, as you might have guessed, is very central to this course because of all the nice properties that um, um, come along with it. Namely, the, the, the extreme regularity and the, the uh, close connection to the concept of a Euclidean space makes these kind of representations, the grid representations, also known as raster representations or voxel representations, very appealing to, to our purpose. However, for your information, these category of objects are also very uh, popular in computer geometry applications and computer graphics, and these are more or less known as vector representations of geometry. But before going into the, the, the gory details of, of these differences, let, let us just uh, take the intuition from this slide that we kind of cannot practically work with these continuous notions of space in a digital computer and that we have to accept to work with these digital representations. And this is not a shortcoming. This is actually something that um, brings about many more possibilities and, and it's very helpful for computational design purposes. So there's nothing wrong with the discrete representation. You should not look at them as um, inferior to continuous representations because as I said in the morning, we are not so much concerned with the shapes of the objects. However, we can 
take any shape from these kind of representations. So there are algorithms that can convert this one directly to this circle if you really need to. But in the meantime, you can more easily decide on the configuration of spaces and you can decide on what to do with every chunk of the space, every pixel, every voxel of the space and get your um, configuration out of it. Well, um, there's a lot of information here, but um, I, I, let, let me tell you upfront why I bother with these terminologies. The reason is that you're working in a field that is multidisciplinary to say the least, and you have to get your head around some concepts from different fields, namely computer-aided design, uh, computer graphics, uh, geographical information systems or GIS, and procedural modeling uh, domains and so on. So the terminologies of these kind of fields differ slightly and that's mainly due to the differences of these uh, companies and the people they hire to, to program certain things. And they do not always call things in the same way. Therefore, the terminology tends to be somewhat confusing. Uh, and for that reason, I've tried um, in the course of yeah, seven, eight years to put together a terminology that is mostly driven by the mathematical commonalities or similarities between these objects. And this terminology might be slightly different from one software application to another. And yet, this is the most consistent mathematical terminology that I could come up with, discarding all the technological um, details and differences between software applications. So for now, we'll be bothering with these terms more and more, especially in the, in the context of the next lecture, I will be talking about topological concepts. And in the lecture after that, I will be talking about graph theory and fields. And for now, today, I'm, I'm going to focus on these ones. For now, it suffices to say that when we are in a certain concept, we may be using different terms for objects of a certain dimension. So in the context of geometry, which is the context of this talk, we're talking about points, lines, polygons, and polyhedrons. In the context of topology, we'll be talking about vertices, edges, faces, and bodies, or cells. And in the context of graph theory, which is the most abstract one, we do not need to bother with lines and points. We, we can just think and talk about objects and their links. These objects can even be people. Yeah? The, the kind of representations that we saw earlier today about the bubble charts or bubble diagrams describing spaces in your building. They don't have to be necessarily points in space, like in geometric concepts. This is an even longer list of these terminologies to, to just give you the impression that these contexts can even vary within themselves. So there are at least three senses of geometry that I know of, and two senses, two very important senses of topology that, that you need to be aware of, and one sense of these objects with these dimensions in, in the study and the modeling of the so-called fields or uh, raster objects. Yeah? So today I'm going to mainly focus on these kind of representations and these kind of representations, the so-called piecewise linear or vector representations of objects. The, the first pictures that I showed you were pictures of these so-called differential objects in geometry, curves, surfaces, solids, and so on. And there's even one more sense of geometry, and that's where I define a turning point for understanding what is the whole concept of dimensionality and what is linear algebra all about, and that is the so-called Euclidean subspaces. Getting more serious with the definition of points, lines, planes, and hyperplanes. Yeah. Before continuing, then I would like to um, divert your attention to the very concept of representation or computer presentation of geometry. So I want to, you to think about how, for instance, a line or a circle is represented in a computer, right? We have an expression like this in, in computer science. We say, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck, right? So think about this. What does it take to represent a line in a computer, in a digital computer? Uh, two points. That's very good. So with two points, then we have 
uh, a basis to define the line. But what do you think about the things that make the line sound like a line, work like a line, walk like a line, etc.? Maybe thickness or, um, yeah, maybe that, how it's shown on the screen, mm -hmm. color. Yeah. But about the functionalities? The radius? It can be the radius of a circle. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting, so maybe you're talking about distance. So a line has a distance, has a property, which could be the radius of a circle, yeah? So Hugo mentioned uh, the visualization of the line to make it sound like a line and seem like a line and so on. So we need some, what we call methods or functions to, to show to the user that what is stored in a computer is actually a line, right? And what Frank said is uh, pertains to a property of a line having a length, which could be the radius of a circle. Can you think of other things that make a line something, an object that everyone can believe, believe in as a line? Direction. A direction, yeah. A vector that defines its direction. So that again is a property. But what do you think a line can do? Can a line, for instance, hit a surface? Yeah, boundary, outline it. It can be an out outline for another object. That's also interesting, but that goes beyond the representation of the line. But think about this. So if we have a line and we have a surface in the space, they can easily intersect, right? And if you want to get that intersection point, that should be a property well, a function, you need a function to get that intersection point, isn't it? Yeah. So there's a very important concept, which we call the information content in what we call a data model, right? I've explained this concept uh, in much more detail in the second uh, set of lecture notes for the geometry and topology lecture. The concept boils down to this. So if you were to represent a line very efficiently, Imagine you're going to report a very important line on a radio channel and you're at war and you have, you have to use Morse code to communicate the information about the line to, the, to your commander or somebody on the other side of the planet. What would be the most efficient way of communicating the data about the line using Morse code? You know what Morse code is, right? Historically speaking that xyz of both of the points and the fact that it's a line mm -hmm. that's a very good one so um and the xyz they can have yeah many decimal points right so if you were to simplify that information then you had to also have a way to to do it with morse code only and that brings about the idea of even representing numbers digitally. So real numbers are things that do not exactly exist in, in digital computers. So we have to represent them with things that we have in digital computers. So in general, we will get to those details later, but in general, just keep this message in your head that what you see is not necessarily what you get. What you see on the screen is probably the result of a function that shows you that object. And we should not delude ourselves into thinking that the object is equal to its picture on the screen of the computer. So the object per se is a very um, kind of concise representation of its information content in the memory of your computer, which in the case of a line would be two sets of coordinates, X, Y, Z coordinates for the start and the end of the line. But together with this whole set of functions that make it look like a line, work like a line, for instance, intersect with other objects, et cetera, then it becomes something that you can work with as a line, right? So, ceci n'est pas un pipe, right? This is not a pipe, this is just the image of a pipe, right? The same thing is true about the lines that you see on the screen, the surfaces that you see on the screen, and so on and so forth, right? So long story short, um, if I 
I mean, this is a mesmerizing question. If I ask you, what do you think is represented to represent these objects in the memory of a computer? You can extend the question and think about the kind of things you need to represent to represent these objects. And that should give you a pre-introduction or prelude to the, the next lecture, which is about topology. If you were to represent or send the information of, about this object over a um, telegraph line with Morse code, what would you send? What would be the most efficient way of sending the information about this object? I mean, the exact answer is not so important because there are multiple ways of doing this, but just thinking about this question will activate your mind to think topologically. Okay, that's, that's a bit of a fancy word for now, but we will talk about it much more in the next lecture. Yeah? So as I said, we are in the context of this talk, we're talking about these kind of representations or the so-called vector representations. And in the rest of the course, we will be dealing mostly with the so-called raster representations um, of objects with pixels and voxels or Lego blocks, if you will, right? But much more abstractly about what it takes to represent them. So if you were to give it a, a crude guess as to what it takes to represent a set of pixels, what would you say? Maybe a matrix. Perfect answer, yes. So you don't really need to draw all these squares to, to keep a memory of this object. You can also just write it down in a matrix and say you have some ones and zeros, right? So one for every black cell and zero for every white cell, right? So in terms of information content, that would be equal to the, to the pixel image that you see here. And that's exactly what you store in the so-called bitmap images, right? And you can imagine immediately an equivalent of this for a 3D representation. So this one will be a three-dimensional array or three-dimensional um, yeah, matrix, if you will, that we call a lattice. So that is implemented in our toolkit for working with voxel objects. Okay. But as I promised, so let me get into the idea of uh, dimensionality uh, more deeply. And so look at these objects once again a zero dimensional object, a one dimensional object being represented with the so-called vectors, vector represented points on its boundary. And so what all these objects have in common is that they have points whose coordinates are stored as vectors. So we'll just get into the idea of vectors in a bit, but for now, just, um, Pay attention to this fact that this is the reason we call them vector representations because they, they heavily depend on these uh, points that can be freely, at least based on an assumption, they can be freely placed in, the, in a three-dimensional space. And therefore, we call them vector representations. Yeah? Again, before gearing up towards the next concepts, let me just... Uh, Ask you one more question. What do you think these uh, acronyms mean? Uh, what you see is what you get versus what you see is what you mean. Uh, what you mean. Okay, perfect, Sipran, thank you. So um, do, do you see the connection with these two objects? So computer geometry representation, I mean, has been easy for quite a few years already since 1970s, 1980s. You, you have access to computer-aided design and GIS packages in which you can draw objects. And based on the paradigm of what you see is what you get. You draw a circle, you have a circle, right? And that is nice, but it also confuses people as to the real nature of these objects. So if, if you ask me what, what a circle is, I would say it's a, it's a locus of points. These, uh, these are some geeky words, but I'll, I'll tell you how useful these concepts are. It's a locus of points whose distance is to a certain point called a center is equal to a number called radius, right? That definition of a circle is much richer than just drawing a circle. Because with that definition, you can think about higher dimensional circles. You can think about circles that do not look very circular. That's a surprise. That's a very interesting surprise. So there is even a sense in which a square can be a circle. There is even a sense in which a, a, a rectangle can be a circle in that sense. Just by changing the notion of a distance, then you can get a circle that does not look even like a, like a regular shape. It can look like a, 
very strange boundary because it's a definition of a locus, which is kind of like a mathematical location of some points which have something in common, a property in this case uh, in, uh, is the, the distance being equal to a certain point called the center of that circle, right? So this definition is a much richer concept coming from the so-called Pythagoras theorem or the Euclidean distance of these points defined by X and Y coordinates to a certain point called center. There's an even more general definition of this just to help you see this more clearly. So it can be X minus X zero of some center squared plus Y minus Y zero of the center equal to R squared for some number R. Do you see the connection to the Pythagoras theorem? So if this is your point in space and this is your center point, so-called center point, what is common really about all these points on the circle? I think it's not- To the formula? Yeah, so- At least they can be calculated using the formula. Yeah, so if you form a triangle, a right triangle from the so-called X and Y coordinates, so, this length will be equal to the y, this length will be equal to the x, and this will be the radius, right? So they all, so what's common between all these points is that they all comply with this formula. And if we badly want to see the circle as a circle, as a nice and continuous circle, then what can we do? What's the easiest thing we can do? Referring back to the concepts we talked about so far. We have this bunch of points and we want to make a nice circle out of them. What do we do? If you were to do it by hand. line, yeah. So we make a bunch of lines in between them, or a polyline. And if we have enough of these points, then this polyline looks smooth enough, right? Yeah. Good enough for someone to believe that this is in fact a, a nice and smooth circle. In fact, even this very circle that you see here is rendered by a bunch of pixels, right? So it's not exactly a very continuous circle, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. But why do I always start with a circle? Because arguably this is the most fascinating object in the whole history of mathematics that still occupies the minds of mathematicians and there are still interesting things coming up about circles and, and their high dimensional equivalence. Okay. And this is yet another representation of a circle using concepts from trigonometry as a refresher. So well, this is not exactly about linear algebra, nevertheless, it is so central to our discussions that I, I find it useful to remind you of some basic concepts. And I kind of believe that these concepts should be enough to, to get you started. So if you are asking yourself why mathematicians over the course of a few thousand years have bothered with these kind of equations, cosines and sines and so on. Then it's interesting to, to think about the history of geometry. The, the word geometry actually comes from two Greek words, geos and methria. And their, their job, the, the job of the so-called geometers was to survey the land and they were usually at the service of the kings and, and governors computing how much tax farmers should pay and so on and so forth. But we are not tax collectors anymore. We are just mathematicians now. Nevertheless, it's interesting to know the history, right? So if you want to measure the, the lengths over like a, a, a huge horizon and so on, sometimes you have to guess the size of objects at a distance. And then you start seeing some patterns. So imagine you see some object next to which someone is standing, a person, at a far distance and you can measure the angle at which you see the object. Imagine you have something that is called a sextant, the, the kind of object that navigators and uh, 
um, marine, uh, marine uh, soldiers have or used to have in the past, right? So you see this object, which could be a building at a far distance. And you want to guess what's the height of this object, right? So if you have once figured out the, the so-called proportions in a triangle once in your life, then you will quickly see, um, based on the so-called Thales theorem, that the proportions in this right triangle are going to be the same as this other right triangle, right? Hence the name trigonometry. So which is about the study of triangles and the so-called trigonometrics, yeah? So the, the, the metrics that pertain to triangles or the right triangles to be more precise, yeah? So if I've once computed the, the proportion of this, um, but let's say we wanted to figure out the distance between ourselves and the, this object as part of a surveying job. If I have once figured out the proportion of this length to this length, and if I can guess that if I put one more person on top of this person and maybe one more person on top of this other person, so this building looks like three people standing on top of each other, right? I can guess that, right? And then I can also assume that each of those people is like, I don't know, you can be taller, but let me guess, let's say 1.7 meters, right? So this building should be about, I don't know, three times this amount, which is, yeah, something about 4.5 plus six. So that would be 5.1, if I mistake not, right? So then the question is, how much is this distance, right? So geometers have, have figured out a way to, to pre-record all these kind of uh, proportions and, and they call them with these slightly weird names, cosine, sine, tangent, cotangent, etc. right? So one of these proportions is the proportion of the y and the x in this triangle. And to keep things simple, because we can always refer to another triangle, another triangle, and all these triangles have these proportions in common, then it's probably useful to think about what we call a trigonometric circle. A circle whose radius is equal to one exactly, to keep these proportions simple. And that is called the trigonometric circle, right? In which, well, if R is equal to one, then at least two of these proportions will be equal to the coordinates of this point, this very point. Yeah, which proportions? x over r will be equal to the so-called cosine of theta, theta being this angle measured in degree. And the other proportion is sine of theta being equal to y over r. When r is equal to one, then these fractions simplify into just x and y. right? X divided by one, Y divided by one, then become, they become X and Y. Or more generally, you can say that let's multiply both sides by R and say R times cosine of theta equals X. And R times sine of theta equals Y. Before going further, let me summarize what we just talked about so far. So since really ancient times, mathematicians have bothered with computing these proportions, the sines, cosines, and their, their derivatives like uh, sine of theta over cosine of theta is defined as tangent of theta, which is another proportion, which is exactly the proportion we need here to guesstimate or estimate the, the distance between ourselves and the, the object of interest. So if we have pre-computed this and we can look at the lookup table, then we can guess what is the distance between ourselves and the building in question, right? And that's the difference of an ordinary person and a surveyor. A surveyor can, can, can guess these things using some pre-computed values and some mathematics, right? Then you can work for the king and, and help with the tax collection or become a mathematician, yeah? So these things have been very useful in the course of history.
And therefore, people have, have bothered with computing these and even recording for some famous angles like 90 degrees. What do you think will be the cosine of 90 degrees? That would be zero. Zero, exactly, because that we are talking about the shadow on the x-axis, which in the case of a 90 degrees angle will be no shadow, therefore zero length. And the sign of zero degrees will be zero as well for the same reason, because it does not have a shadow on the y-axis. For the shadow, just look at the other axis. So this point seems to have a shadow here that is exactly equal to y, which you can see also on the other side, right? So then you get to pre-computed values or tables of cosines, sines, tangents, and cotangents, right? Do you see now the connection with the concepts that we talked about so far? So x being equal to r times cosine of theta and y equal to r sine of theta, that seems to describe just about any point in this circle, right? And if I, well, I, I showed you that all these points on this circle have the property that then when they are, uh, when their coordinates are squared and added together, they, they always end up being the same number, which is equal to the radius. And for that reason, you can also see that r squared cosine of theta squared, which is shown as cosine two of theta, plus r squared sine of theta, also squared, should be equal to r squared from the Pythagoras theorem that gives us what is known as a, a trigonometric identity, which means cosine of theta for every angle squared plus sine of theta for that angle squared should equal to what? One, because I divided both sides of this equation by r squared, you know? This is one of those things that is known as a trigonometric identity. If you had to go to an old fashioned way of studying, then you had to memorize so many of these trigonometric identities. But the good news is that I've gone through that kind of an old fashioned education system, but I know that I don't need to memorize these identities anymore because I know the concept. So this is as much as you need to understand trigonometry. The rest is ways to prove these kind of identities and there's something very useful nowadays called Google. So when in doubt, you can also ask Google what these things are, right? So the concept is more important than, than memorizing these equations and numbers. But there's something more interesting popping up here. And I know we are short in time, but I, I hope that you see what, what's interesting about this one. So if we describe the points on this locus with these equations, which seem to be quite general, then we can, instead of theta, we can call them with t. So imagine this is the course of someone moving around this circle. At every moment in time, um, being uh, a number in the range of zero to two times pi, then we can generate some discrete points by saying that t can be equal to two times pi times a number, call it i, divided by n, which is the number of points you want to generate on this circle. Yeah, and this simple equation gives you a bunch of points. First, it gives you a bunch of points on the line, on a one dimensional line starting from zero and two times pi, let's say we have 10. So the next one will be two times pi divided by 10. The next one will be uh, two times pi times, let's say numbers range from 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. Or if you're not comfortable with 0, let's start from 1. Then every time we multiply one of these numbers with this number, and then we get a number in this range. If you map these numbers, if you badly want to see these numbers, you can see them along an axis and seeing that they form numbers in the range of 0 to 1. Does that sound interesting to you? With some numbers ranging in the, uh, in, the, in the interval of zero to one, you can generate some numbers ranging in the interval of zero to two times pi. But before going further, let me ask you this weird question. 
about the number pi, which I'm sure you know what it is roughly. But imagine that we were baking a very large pizza or a very large cake, and I, I told you that I want, um, a so-called one radian of this pizza or pie. One radian is a measure of angles, which is different from um, degrees. So you know about 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 90 degrees, and so on. But in mathematics, we use a different measurement system for angles, which is called radians. And that's what pertains these numbers to the number pi. So assuming that the whole circle is two times pi radians, if you just accept the definition, how greedy do you think I am about the pizza or the pie when I say I want one radian of the whole pie for myself? You're taking a half. A half? <laughs> no, not that you, greedy. You're taking approximately sixth, right? Yes, that's a perfect answer. Who was that? Me. Sandra. Okay. Why? Um, because pi is equal to about three, and the circle is two times pi. So exactly. if you take only one part. Yeah. So it's, it's slightly less than one sixth of the pizza because this is going to be two times pi radians is the whole circle, which is equal to three six three hundred sixty degrees. So one radian should be about a bit less than one-sixth of 360 degrees, which is more or less 57 degrees or so, something around that number. So if you were sharing a pizza, that would be like this much for me and the rest for all of you together, yeah? <laughs> okay, so just get used to the fact that we are going to work with radians as a measurement system and another interesting fact about the circle. That if we say that one radian is about a sixth of the, the pizza, what about the length of this arc on the circle for one radian? What do you think the length of that arc will be? Uh, the same as the angle in radians. Which is equal to? Um, in this case, about one fourth pi. Or, well, your, um, your first answer was perfect, but... Uh, what uh, circle do you mean, sorry? The trigonometric circle, let's say. Let's say we have baked a pizza with the radius of one meter. Yeah. And then I want uh, one radian of that pizza. Oh, that's one pi. And it's then uh, what is the length of the crust of that pizza slice? Um, one pi, right? Uh, one one radian. 14 meters. Okay, I think you need a piece of paper, but you know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? The first answer of Hugo was uh, was very good. It would be so one. I said one what? Just one. The length one. of the radian. The length of the radius. Okay, do, don't you need a measurement unit? Uh, well, it, it, just to define the diameter of the... Uh, one meter. One meter, yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> oh, <amazing. laughs> yes, one meter. Yeah, because I said the pizza is baked with a radius of one meter. So one radian along the, the perimeter mm -hmm. of the pizza will be exactly one meter again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because the entire perimeter of the circle will be two times mm -hmm. pi meters, which will be 6.28 meters or something, right? Yeah. You can give it a try. Next time you grab a, a glass like this, uh, you can bet on this question in a pub. Uh, guess what, which one is to, uh, longer? If I try to grab this glass with my fingers, then most of the times I cannot manage to grab the entire glass, right? The, the perimeter of most glasses is actually larger than their height, yeah? So this was the perimeter now. From my thumb to my middle finger, this is the perimeter of the circle, which is even slightly less than the actual perimeter, yeah? It's a circular object. So two times pi times the radius is the actual perimeter of a circle, right? Which is typically larger than even the height of the circle. Sander has an interesting beer pint, so maybe you can give it a try and tell me 
which one is larger, the height of the, the glass or the, the perimeter? Try it with your fingers. The perimeter, because I can do this. <laughs> yes. I can't, I can't do this. Yeah, even though it's a very tall glass, then it is still the case, yeah? Okay. So maybe enough about circles because we have bigger fish to fry, okay. Um, as I said, it's going to be a mission impossible to pass you all this information about this. So that's why I've written the longer story in the lecture notes. So in this lecture, I'm trying to pass to you some of the underlying concepts and you can read about the rest more, in more detail in those lecture notes. Um, before going further, let, let us talk a little bit about the necessity of different kinds of geometries or even the, the reason to have something called topology. Um, let us assume ourselves in the role of the old geometers, surveyors of land. So if your job was to survey uh, land belonging to some family, then you could probably get away with these kind of representations of the so-called Euclidean space. Um, we call them Euclidean in the honor of Euclides or Euclid, the Greek mathematician of ancient times. And so you could get away with this kind of geometry that I'm sure you're all familiar with to, to some extent from high school mathematics and even primary school, right? But then when we get into, for instance, surveying the land in a country, then we have to somehow face the fact that, well, okay, we were all the time thinking about the, the, the rectangle being, the whole earth being flat and so on and so forth, right? But then we have to grow up and, and accept the fact that actually we are talking about the surface of a sphere, right? Therefore, the real object of interest when, when you're talking about the, for instance, the whole surface area of the Netherlands, even though it's a very flat country, then it is still located on the, on the surface of a sphere. Therefore, you have to deal with these kind of geometries, elliptic geometries. For those of you who are going to follow geomatics, just um, know the fact that there are multiple ways of making a map between the elliptical geometry to a, a, a Euclidean geometry or making rectangular representations with two coordinates, latitude and longitude. There is not a single way, but multiple ways of doing this. And one way or another, we are distorting the geometry. So a triangle here is geometrically distorted when we are representing it on a map like this, right? But at the same time, it can still remain a triangle in what sense, right? When we are distorting the geometry, then another sense can, can stay correct, right? That, that other sense is a topological sense. Or let, let me help you a little bit. You remember how I defined a circle? I defined it as a locus of points whose distance to, to a certain point called the center is equal to a number called the radius, right? Can, can you come up with a def similar definition for a triangle, which is not so much dependent on geometry? What do you think makes this triangle a triangle? Is it really the shape or is it something else? Three points. Yeah, that's a good start. Connected with what? Closest possible distance, line? Perfect answer. Okay, closest possible. I'm, I'm happy that you didn't say a line immediately because that takes us to the very definition of distance, in fact, right? If you were to measure distance between two points, Is it correct to say that the distance between two points is always uh, the length of a straight line between them? Can you think of a counterexample? Say this is where you live and here's a canal or a river or a highway that you cannot pass through, yeah, if you want to live safe and the only bridge is here. So the closest distance from this point to this point for a pedestrian would be maybe through some alleys and then through this bridge and then here, right? So if I asked you what's the distance between these two points, it wouldn't be the distance between, uh, the distance of the length of a straight line, right? That's the distance for crows and other birds. The expression as a crow flies, yes, that is true, right? A crow can, can fly straight from here to here. Therefore, the distance for a crow is different from a distance for a human, right? 
And so in that sense, it has something to do with movement and, and trajectories, right? So how does this pertain to this triangle here? As Liva said, so we have the shortest path between these two points on the surface of this object that connects these three points together. That makes a generalizable definition of a triangle, which can even look like this on an urban network. So I hope that you're not uncomfortable with this definition, but this can be a perfect triangle as far as I'm concerned on an urban network. You have three points of interest and you have three shortest paths between them. That makes it a perfect triangle as far as I'm concerned, right? With a topological definition rather than a geometric definition, right? And well, long story short, we have to deal with and accept the fact that there are non-Euclidean geometries like elliptic geometry, hyperbolic geometry, and also even more general types of geometry on these kind of other manifolds in which the distance or the metric is defined in some other way. It doesn't have to be the Euclidean distance. Okay, but we have been kind of talking a lot about this gentleman Euclidus, but kind of avoiding him at the same time. So let me skip a few slides and, and get to his definition of the Euclidean definition of dimensionality and space, and then go back to these slides and get there. And maybe I can, I can manage to go to almost a half of these slides, but I have to also give you a break every 45 minutes. So we are running out of time. So if you want to have a short break, then let's take a break because yeah, we, we're going to have to talk about many more things and I'm not going to make it a very tough one, but I'm okay with continuing if you want to continue. Uh, otherwise let's have a, like a five minute break or something like that, right? And I'll be here if you have questions. Uh, I had a quick question about the equation of the circle uh, on the slides earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not very common with the way to write down uh, things in math. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can do this. What okay. does, Shall I help you decipher this? Uh, yeah, what does that, that mean, the, the straight line from up and down? This means such that. Sorry, such that? Such that. Okay. Yeah. And Oh, the, such are the pi's. Uh, yeah, I is element. Of, yeah, okay. So this one means, okay, let me. Yeah, yeah, very, I, I've, very I've good seen the, uh, the means, others I've seen before. This one means in, and this sign is now used to define uh, a closed boundary for the interval. It could have been like this as well. So let's say from A to B, but not including B itself. That would be another sort of interval. It could also be from A to B, but excluding A and B themselves then you would write it like this, or it could be A, but including B. So we are talking about intervals of points and sometimes geometrically we can show them with, with field dots and so on. So in this case, it would be something like this, from A to B in a straight line, including this whole range of numbers in between, but excluding the number A itself. So the number A is said to be the boundary for the interval, right? Yeah, I get that. Which is actually a zero dimensional point with only one coordinate for now. Wait, you, sorry, what, what do you mean with that exactly? So it's a point in a one dimensional space, right? Even though, yeah. well, it looks like a point, right? Doesn't it? But oh, the, 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 if you exclude A, then A is a zero dimensional point on yeah, yeah, yeah. two dimensional space. Well, in any case, it is a zero dimensional point because this is a space, it's a one dimensional space, the line. And oh, it, yeah. It's a point already. Okay. It doesn't have to be three dimensional or two dimensional to be a point. Mm -hmm. 
So this one means in, and this one means such that. What else? This one means a subset of. Yes, yeah, I've seen the others in linear algebra. Yeah. So. Okay. Cool. And this is the set of natural numbers or integers. Well, only positive integers. Yeah. Is there another, is there a different one for the negative set of integers or? Yeah, it's for, for the whole set of integers, including the, the, the negative ones, you have Z. Okay. Like this. Thanks. Wait, where did you get the course linear algebra? Uh, in the, the, what do you say? Oh. Um, it's electrical engineering. Okay. So I got it from uh, Joost, Joost de Groot. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> I'm not sure if I finished my final exam, but. Okay. <laughs> Can be a tough one, yeah. Yeah, it is. A very it simple is. version here. Okay. But I'm happy to hear that you are taking this. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna try and I'm try and uh, pass it anyway. Yeah. Very good resolution. Take a moment of rest. Huh? I yeah. didn't want to bring you back. Can I ask another question about this slide? Sure. And um, what do you mean by the, you have like two inputs and one output is your code, but what's the plain input? Ah, okay, very good question. So um, as a general recommendation, um, you remember that I had a simpler definition of a circle with X mm -hmm. squared plus Y squared equals R squared. Yeah. But in real practice, then the question is to what coordinate system are we referring, right? It can be the, the corner of my fingers here. Mm -hmm. It can be rotated. It can be the corner of the you, room you're sitting in. It can be on a, on a window, you know. It can be in many places, right? Yeah. The best definition we can have about where is something that we can call a plane or a, or a local coordinate system. So okay. you, can, you can think about it as being equivalent to a local coordinate system. So you always see points as a plane, kind of. Not exactly a point as a plane, but this is in fact the, the last item on the agenda of today, but it's very good okay. that you mentioned it because uh, yeah, this is something that I might have forgotten to talk about. So, well, we, we know what X and Y are kind of, right? But, it's important to remember that there are relative distances to some point that we have to first agree upon, right? Mm -hmm. In the case of the planet Earth, we are, when we talk about X and Y, usually they're measured in degrees. So if you just Google the, the coordinates of Delft, 
then you will find two numbers which seem a little bit strange at first look. And there are in fact some angles, right, from the equator towards the north. And one of them is the, from the Greenwich line towards the east. So you will see some angle, um, you know, something should be around 50 something degrees or maybe even more towards the north and some, a few degrees towards the east because we are close to Greenwich here. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's very important where we are measuring these numbers from, right? Not so long time, uh, long ago, the, the, these coordinates, well, from the equator is kind of clear where we are measuring from, right? But instead of London being the center of the world in that sense, it used to be Paris, not so long ago, maybe 200 years ago or so, right? So all the so, coordinates were different yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. So okay. uh, the old maps, <laughs> according to the French, we used to be different from the, from the maps that we are used to today. So, but long story short, in design, it happens even more often, right? In the case of planet Earth, there's only one planet Earth, but you open your AutoCAD or Rhino, you start drawing in one coordinate system, I draw in another coordinate, even within the same file, sometimes you want to have objects placed on something, right? Then on something or somewhere, can best be described not only by a position, but also what we call an orientation, right? The orientation is something that we can best present with a plane. So there seems to be an orientation on these uh, so-called trigonometric circles. That's what I probably forgot to mention, but thanks to your question, I can talk about it now. <laughs> orientation is actually what we call the positive trigonometric orientation. If I tell you, rotate something on this location, on this plane, 45 degrees, that immediately implies that I mean counterclockwise rotation. That is a convention, of course, right? We had to assume mm -hmm. that one direction is positive, the other one is negative, right? But that, yeah. as far as I know, is the most widely accepted convention. No? Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, there's, there's something about orientation on a plane and also the plane being a two-dimensional space. We will get into that. And that sense of a plane is explained also at the end of the lecture notes. Okay. And, um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I think everybody's back, right? Okay, so let's uh, resume. Um, well, I, I told you from the beginning that linear algebra is, is very much about vectors and matrices and so on in general. And yet this lecture is also partly about the, the fundamentals or the rudimentary concepts about computer graphics and geometry representation in computers. Therefore, there was a long you know, delay to get to this point. But in fact, these objects are kind of like the main things that we have to talk about today. And before making the association between vectors and arrows in your mind, this might be something that you've heard before. I want you to do, to do the reverse and disassociate vectors with arrows, okay? But this, these are only examples uh, of how we can think about vectors and try to get an intuition about how they work and especially in low dimensional spaces, in uh, phenomena that we can observe ar around us. So it's, it's just a representation. It's like a, the picture of a pipe. It's not the pipe itself. The, the pipe itself in this case is a vector which describes something that we can very, very easily, even more easily than drawing this, we can represent in a computer. That will be a couple of numbers, right? But before we get getting into that, let me tell you why this, this has been appealing for such a long time in the history of the development of mathematics. And imagine that you are rowing in a, in a canal or a river and you're not as sporty as much is and you run out of power and that you have two friends with their boats who have to kind of pull your boat, right? Well, 
So the two friends with their boats, they're pulling your boat, well, slightly in these directions, actually. So we're talking about quantities, physical quantities that have a direction. In this case, the physical quantity in question is a force, right? And if you were to determine the direction in which your boat will go, and so in this boat, there's much, so this one is going faster than this other one, or with a stronger force. And yeah, so then how do we determine the direction and the, the force with which this boat in which we're all sitting is going, right? That will be a vector sum of these two forces. That's probably the oldest um, context in which vectors have appeared. Mechanics is a branch of physics and, and we're dealing with quantities, physical quantities like, like force. And then it appears that you cannot just add them by numbers, right? Even if you knew like that they are pulling your boat with uh, say, I don't know, 1,400 Newton of force. It is a quantity, it has a, a unit even called Newton. And this one, I don't know, with 1,200 Newtons and so on. Right? Then you could not say, okay, this boat is being pulled with uh, 2,600 Newtons of force. Because still you need to know the direction of these forces, the direction at which they're being applied and so on, right? So it's not a simple sum like this plus this equals this, right? It appears that something else is at play, which is the direction. And it's also because that there's a surface of the water in this case is a two dimensional space in which the vector sum must be the answer. Another example. So imagine you give someone some, um, direction, this is, let's say, the north, and this is the east, they ask you about an address, you tell them, okay, go like 200 meters forward and then 300 meters slightly to the right. Yeah? If the person in question could kind of fly magically from here to here, they would end up at this point, but they would not necessarily fly uh, through these two directions that you gave them. They would just go through this line, right? That would get the job done, yeah? But if you take the, the change in the position of that person, especially in reference to another coordinate reference system, Then it appears that this third vector, so if, if we can accept that we can present every single point in this space with a bunch of coordinates, right? That should immediately give you an idea of what vectors actually are. They are arrays of coordinates, right? Then if you wanted to get the, the final coordinate after these two movements in space, then guess what you can do? In a computer, when you want to add uh, two vectors or some vectors together, you're not going to draw this picture to give that answer. What are you going to do? Anybody? If it's taking you long, then don't worry because it, has, it took the mathematicians a long, long time to get to this answer. Pythagoras? Sorry? Pythagoras? Pythagoras. Yeah. Yeah, so for people like Pythagoras and Euclid and so on, uh, it took so many years until the time of this other mathematician uh, in whose honor we call this the Cartesian world, right? Who do you think he is? Anybody? Can you guess? René Descartes, the French mathematician. In English, people prefer to refer to this part. We call this Cartesian 
a Cartesian coordinate system in, on, in the honor of René Descartes, the philosopher and um, mathematician, the French philosopher and mathematician, the same, the same guy who said, I think, therefore I am, right? So that was revolutionary in the, in the history of mathematics. Uh, well, he proposed that since when we are talking about vectors, we are in fact talking about directions, right? And a direction doesn't have a real location, so to speak, right? So if you tell someone go like towards the north for 100 meters, it doesn't really have a location. So that's one of the most important reasons why I tell you to disassociate vectors with, uh, with arrows, right? It's, it's not located anywhere, it's a direction. So you tell someone towards the north, towards the east, towards the west, and so on and so forth, right? Towards that direction, and you want to give it uh, a definition. And then, but René Descartes figured that um, you, you don't actually need to um, all the time worry about drawing these directions. You can actually represent them once according to a coordinate reference system and say, okay, since we're talking about directions, if we were to describe this direction in black, then we could describe it in terms of its constituent directions. And we, can, we could break this up in terms of its components. The same way we found the shadows of a point on the, the two axes of a coordinate system for within a circle, we could kind of find the shadow of this along the axis of y, along the axis of x, and along the axis of z, z coordinate. Do you see what's happening here? So if I told you that, the, well, if I gave someone the address and told them to go, like, um, take 300 meters of steps uh, rightward and then like, or eastward and 400 meters of going towards the north, what would be the meaning of this direction? In fact, I'm pointing to a general direction that would be equal to this, right? So isn't it fair to describe this direction as a sum of 300 and 400 if you are referring to x and y coordinates? The first one corresponding to x, the second one corresponding to y, right? And if you don't mind, I want to break up the association with arrows right away and tell you something interesting. So if I measured your, your taste for you know, the kind of beer you like, the, your, your age, your, your, your uh, choice for that being a reflectionist, a diagram, a preacher, et cetera, et cetera, and we represented all of these things with a number, then I could imagine that I can make a kind of like a, I don't know, a 12 dimensional array of this kind. And I could, I could describe your, your general direction in life, right? And uh, whether you're a vegetarian or not, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so all these things that, that can define your general directions in life can, can actually constitute a vector that describes your general orientation in life, right? And therefore, we can also talk about similarities between your general directions in life, political taste, aesthetic taste, taste for beer, for food, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then we can, we can somehow even look at the similarities in a mathematical sense, if you like, we can do this as once as again. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be a three-dimensional arrow that you draw. And sometimes you may even hear politicians saying something like, my opinion almost on every matter differs from your opinion like by 180 degrees, right? Which sounds like an absurd uh, definition, but I can tell you that it's a very, very accurate description. Because the moment you describe vectors like this, you can also do other things with vectors, um, namely computing the angle between them. And that angle doesn't have to be necessarily on a two-dimensional plane, it can be the concept of an angle the difference of directions or the similarity of the directions, if you will. Can you guess what would that be about? The similarity between two vectors? 
It's not probably a fair question because I haven't yet explained the concept, but if you have a wild guess, just tell me. Any idea? So if uh, the, uh, uh, yeah. the cross product is about the parallelity, how do you say that? If two yeah. vectors are parallel to each other, mm -hmm. maybe also similar. Okay, that is okay. very, very close. Very, very close, but uh, it's the other one, the dot product that does that job. So if two vectors are exactly similar to each other or pointing towards the same direction, the dot product will be maximal. And let me then cut the chase and the, let's take this as a motivation to, to understand what is a dot product and what is a cross product. And I think that's as far as I can manage to go with today's lecture and it should do the job. So is this idea intuitive to all of you, like representing vectors with coordinates? Yeah, and let's, let's get uh, this into our head as the normal definition of a vector, which is about coordinates and, and directions in general. So there are some reasons as to which you might prefer to actually detach vectors from coordinate systems. But for the purposes of this course, um, it's perfectly fine to assume that vectors are all about coordinates. But there's even a more general sense in which vectors are not bound to a certain coordinate reference system. And that sense sounds more like defining vectors as general directions in a space, which should not change under different representations with different coordinate systems. But that's too geeky for our purposes. So let's, uh, let's assume that vectors can be sufficiently described with coordinates in a coordinate reference system. So that, that is the great invention of René Descartes um, that kickstarted the whole idea of so-called analytic geometry. And it makes it possible for us to compute with vectors. So as you can imagine, every time we have two vectors, we are not going to draw these uh, kind of parallelograms and these shapes to give an answer to what is the sum of vectors in, in a computer. We are going to do these kind of things. We're going to add them coordinate by coordinate to get an answer to the, to the vector sum. And that will be a perfect answer. So we don't have to bother with drawing shapes, right? So contrary to what many people think, we are not going to draw a picture every time we're going to compute uh, the answer to the vector sum question. And why do we need to compute the vector sum whenever we have two forces, whenever we have um, two vector quantities that have to be added together, we need a vector sum. And I will show you cases in which we have to do other operations with vectors, namely the dot product and cross product. But this is a very important concept. So let me just proceed slowly and gradually to, through the important concepts. That's the concept of dimensionality taken more seriously. So usually you see these, these uh, terms like a three-dimensional space, a two-dimensional space, and you see even these signs like r to the power of three, r to the power of two, and r. So what is r? r is the, like the, the general set of real numbers, which in fact do not exist in computers, take my words. We have to work with approximations of real numbers, which are called floats in computation, right? But for a second, let's forget about those geeky details. We will get to the, those in, uh, in the course of other lectures. But for now, let, let us assume that there is actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of real numbers and a line, right? With one important detail. So if you think of a line as a mathematical object that describes a locus of points, um, let's say it can be this line. By the way, this is a very important concept, but I have to just mention it now. I can tell you that a line can be the locus of points defined by a vector, which could be the starting point of the line and every other vector along this line, which is um, in the direction 
which is moving away from this point in the direction of one other vector, which is called the orientation of the line or the direction of the line. So if I add these two vectors, I will get this point, right? Can, can you agree with that, right? If I add this vector with this vector, which is the direction of movement along this line, I will get an, an, another vector, which points to a point, another point on the same line, right? So would it be fair to say that this line in question is the locus of points whose coordinates are defined based on some P0, which is the starting point, plus the direction vector d times some multiplied by some number, let's say alpha. And this d is a vector, this point is a vector. So when we are writing vectors on a blackboard, whiteboard, a whiteboard or on a piece of paper, I usually draw these lines underneath them to differentiate them from the so-called scalars. Scalars are numbers that do not have a direction, like two euros, three euros, three euros of depth, negative three euros, they don't have a direction, they just have a sign, right? Those are so-called scalar quantities, they don't have a direction. But when you are talking about force, when we are talking about movement, displacement, and so on, these are quantities that do have a direction in their nature. Therefore, we have to talk about them as vectors. When we are writing mathematics, then we differentiate them by putting these lines, or when we are typing, we use bold letters to, to differentiate them. Anyhow, long story short, this can be the definition of the locus of such points. Especially if I say alpha can be in the range of real numbers. In the range is shown with this sign, and this is the range of all real numbers. So in fact, the set of real numbers refers to all such lines. Yeah, and, and that also makes it possible to draw a line and say this is equal to the real numbers. Except for one fact, you need to know where is P0, right? So, but if I just put a point, say here is zero, then I get one meter away from this point that will be equal to the real number exactly 1.000000, right? And if I get uh, like, I don't know, radical two meters away from this point, that would be 1.47, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have probably countless decimal points after that. But in computer representations, everything is finite and discrete. So we have to work with approximations of, of these numbers. That was the point, but anyhow. So you have some idea of a one dimensional space already. And you see the connection with the, the set of real numbers from this example, which was a more advanced example, but I gave it here than, nevertheless to make the connection even clearer. But now let's think about why we are talking about R squared and R cubed. Do they make any sense in the sense of really squaring these numbers or is it something else? Well, to cut the chase, it is, actually something else that we're talking about. It's not really about multiplying the set of numbers R with the, with the other numbers in R. It's actually about something else, which is called the Cartesian product of sets, again, named in the honor of René Descartes. He actually came up with this definition that was, so that the definition of a coordinate system was not just putting three axes together and making a, a coordinate system, it was actually based on this concept. So imagine you have two sets and that you define this. So at first it looks like a useless thing to do, right? To, to define the Cartesian product of these two sets, right? So A, B, B and C are in this set and one and two are in this set. And then René Descartes being a philosopher and a mathematician. Um, so he figured this is a useful thing to do, right? And it proved to be useful. So he said, let's make some tuples. A tuple is a, is a generalization of the concept of a double. So you have a double, like a pair of things, a triple, a triplet of things, a quadruple, and, and a quintuple, and a sextuple. And in general, you can call them an n-tuple or a tuple, right? So he figured, okay, we can make these tuples of things, 
And we indicate them, interestingly enough, with parentheses. In the same way, in, in Python, we represent tuples with parentheses. And he said, OK, let's define this concept, the Cartesian product of sets. And this product set will contain tuples of items, respectively coming from these two other sets. So you take every item in this set, and you kind of match it or pair it with an item in another set. And you form a set of tuples consisting of elements coming from each of these sets, right? And if you take this concept, then you can see how it pertains to this business. So if you have a set of numbers in R and you have another set of numbers in R, you can make pairings of these numbers and you can make a set containing tuples of numbers coming from R. And that will make you a two dimensional system. So I would define R squared. In this sense, it's not really squared, but it's a Cartesian product as tuples of points with x and y coordinates such that x and y are both in R. That's it. So if I represented these two, number, uh, these two sets along these two axes, just because I can, then their combinations, the tuples, every single tuple would correspond to a point here. But even more interestingly, I could call these tuples vectors because, well, tuples are easier to write in a line like this, but I could have also written, instead of a tuple, I could have written x and y with a little sign t here with the braces. Let me write it again, which would equal to this one dimensional array of coordinates. But this little sign t is that we are transposing it because we want to write on a line. We are, we are preferring to, to write them on a line and we say the vector is transposed. So congratulations, you also got to know what is transposition and what is a transpose vector, okay? So a transpose vector is a vector whose, whose coordinates or whose entries are um, written um, in rows if they used to be in a column and if written in columns if they used to be in rows and so on, right? So every column becomes a row and every row becomes a column when you transpose a vector. So this was a column vector, which is the standard representation of a vector. When you write it like this, it becomes a transpose vector, but conceptually it's almost the same as this tuple, except for one thing. Well, defining something like adding tuples to another and tuple and so on, it's, it's kind of like an arbitrary system. But when we speak about vectors, we are actually talking about some operators that operate on vectors. Remember, what makes a line a line is something that makes a line work like a line, right? So when we speak about vectors, then we are speaking about the things we can do with vectors or the things we're supposed to be able to do with vectors, right? Such as adding them together. That's probably an arbitrary thing at the first look, but then you can look at physics and the case of boats in a river or a canal and, and so on and so forth. And then you can see that it's, it's not so arbitrary. It's actually helping us to describe some phenomena with such level of precision. Yeah? And we can predict and we can, we can compute, right? So, this is why we call them R squared, R3, and so on. So when we are talking about the Euclidean spaces, we are talking about these kind of supersets. And this concept, interestingly enough, is also the very concept with which we are defining pixels and voxels in terms of their information contents. Because we don't have to talk about the coordinates of their centers anymore. We can talk about some numbers referring to their integer positions, like one, two, and so on. It doesn't have to be always r squared. It can also be z squared, z being the set of integer numbers. So if the two numbers coming together are integers, then we will have a pair of integers. Yeah? That would be a point in the space z squared. So this is, in fact, a definition of the kind of spaces we have been talking about so far. And these are called Euclidean spaces. Yeah? But interestingly enough, well, Euclid is from, I don't know, sometime before Christ and uh, Descartes is, I think, if I mistake, not from 17th or 18th century. 
So it took so long to get to this level of improvement, right? But so interesting enough, interestingly enough, the definition of the Euclidean space is completed with the so-called Cartesian product of sets and Cartesian coordinate systems in modern mathematics. Okay. Are you getting bored? Okay, so, uh, well, as I said, to differentiate what is a tuple of just a bunch of points and what is a vector, then we have to think about the things that have to be done with vectors, such as adding forces together, right? Or, well, this one, we talked about it long enough, and you can also imagine that you can also, one of you, I think Frank mentioned the Pythagoras theorem, that directly pertains to the lengths of vectors. And one of the nice things about mathematics is generalization. So the same way you can do it in two dimensions, you can also do it in three dimensions. And even more interestingly, you can do it in n dimensions. So if you go back to the vectors that I told you about the 12 dimensional vectors, describing your taste in food, politics, et cetera, music, et cetera, et cetera, then I could uh, compute the distance, the Euclidean distance between these 12 dimensional vectors and tell you, who of you are most similar to, to each other person in the classroom, right? And then I could do one more interesting thing, which would be the dot product between those vectors. And then I could define the angle of difference between your general direction in life. And then you could kind of point out to the person, the most like-minded person in the class to yourself, right? But what, what would that be about? And, well, this, this is kind of like a interesting application in artificial intelligence nowadays. So the, your supermarket, if you are a member of your supermarket, probably knows more about you than anyone else in the whole world, right? With your choices when you're buying products and so on, you're, you're determining a lot of things about yourself, right? So if they have a long vector of your, of your shopping list, they can pretty much tell, you, tell what you will buy the next time you go to the supermarket, right? Um, anyhow, long story short, this was not the original reason why this concept was defined. Uh, some people think of mathematicians as people all the time playing with uh, puzzles and so on, which is not so far from reality. But um, another big reason for doing mathematics is physics, in fact. And well, to understand the world around us and, and to make sense of it and to predict it and to engineer it, yeah? So in that sense, as I've already explained, there are like different sorts of quantities. So physics is about quantifiable things, right? We're not talking about metaphysics, by the way, in this course. So the number of ghosts in this room and so on and so forth, those are not measurable things. But when we are talking about measurable things and quantifiable things, then, um, then we're talking about quantities in general in physics. There are seven elemental quantities in physics, like length, time, mass, uh, the amount of um, molecules in, in matter and so on and so forth, the amount of uh, uh, lumination intensity and, and so on and so forth. Anyhow, so some of these quantities are said to be vector quantities. Some of them are even higher dimensional quantities called tensor quantities. But for now, let's talk about vector quantities versus, versus um, scalar quantities. So if you're talking about this job, this, I find this the most or the best uh, archetypical example explaining why something like a dot product came into existence between vectors. Imagine you are moving from one place to another and you're asking your friends to help you with the, with the moving. And one of your friends is being a bit lazy and playful sitting on the box and the other person pulling the box Yeah, in this direction. And imagine that you are going to pay back your friends with uh, beer, pizza, whatever. You're going to give them a little gift. And that's going to be something quantifiable. You can even, if they're not exactly your friends, you can even pay them for the job, right? If you paid them, you would pay them in, in euros, in cash, right? And you would not, Definitely not pay this person, but you would pay this person, right? For this person appears to be doing 
at least nothing if not adding to the friction between the box and the ground, right? Yeah, but this person is obviously doing the job, I mean, in the literal sense, right? So, and how much work is being done here? So it has something to do with the effort that that person is putting in this, but also the effect, like, I, I may be putting a lot of effort pushing a wall, but the wall doesn't move, right? The wall doesn't, uh, is not impressed with my force, right? I cannot move the wall, right? But if this person is pulling the box and if the box, box is moving, then you can say, okay, some work is being done. You know, we're making some progress, right? And if you put this into a mathematical definition, then you can say that, well, it has to do with the amount of force, of course, the amount of displacement, right? which is the length of the displacement and the amount of force you can also measure it with a with a spring or something but it also has something to do with uh, with another thing which is how effective is this amount of force right if i pull if the job is to take this play this uh, box from here to here and if i pull this in this direction am i being effective at all or not you know if i pull this in this direction versus this other direction, which one is more effective? The one which is more aligned with the, with the direction of displacement that we're interested in, right? And then it appears that it has something to do with the cosine of this theta, the angle, right? The closer it is to zero, the larger the cosine of theta. And you know now exactly what cosine of theta is, right? We are referring to the, the trigonal trigonometric circle, right? The smaller the angle, the closer these two vectors are together in terms of their coordinates and the more effective the, the job and the higher the amount of work. Thus you see them here, right? But so far it looks a bit sophisticated to compute, but the good news is that it's actually much easier to compute. You don't actually need a protractor to measure the angle between the, the two vectors. There's a digital way to do this, right? But for now, let's let's reflect for a moment on the concept here. The force is a vector, obviously, because it's a vector quantity because not only it has a magnitude, it also has a direction. The displacement as well, it's, well, not only you can measure the length of this displacement, you can also say, don't put that box over there, I want them here. Right? This is the job. You want to make this movement exactly from here to here. Right? So it has a certain direction as well. Right? So again, I would argue that displacement is also a vector quantity. That, that's why we have these little arrows here indicating that it's a vector. And they're also written in bold letters. You know, the, I, I've taken this picture from somewhere. So I'm not saying that the notation is perfect, but it perfectly explains the concepts. I have a better um, set of rules for notations when it comes to vectors and so on. But for now, just accept that this is a vector, this is a vector, and yet the work itself is not a vector. Do you agree? So we, we can talk about the amount of work, and if you remember some things about physics, the amount of work is measured in joules, in kilowatt hours, in, and you can pay for it in euros, in, I don't know, other currency units, dollars, and so on, right? So it's not exactly a vector quantity, the work itself, right? Don't ever mistake negative and positive with direction because that, that's just, a, you can think about it as depth and credit, negative and positive amount, right? But that does not make a quantity a vector quantity. A direction is a spatial direction in a higher dimensional space. So for, for force, uh, it really matters in which direction we, we exert the force, we apply the force, right? So the, the job that this other friend is doing is actually a slightly negative job. So if you take the force that they're exerting on this box, what is the force that this person is exerting in this box? Sitting on the box, that, does that apply a force? Make a gravitational force. Exactly. So, and is that relevant to this job? Or? No, not really. Well, it adds to friction. 
Yeah, yeah it but... adds to the friction, but if you oh, yeah. ignore the friction, if you say if we have a super, super slippery icy surface, mm -hmm. then if you can ignore the friction, so this amount of force, which is the weight of that person, is completely useless in this movement, yeah. this job, right? And you can see that perfectly by cosine of theta, theta being 90 degrees or negative 90 degrees is zero, right? So in that sense, they're doing nothing. But they're also being a little bit more annoying because they're adding to the friction, right? So that will be what kind of a work here? For the other person who is actually pulling the box, they have to compensate for that amount of negative work, right? Because first you have to overcome that friction. That means you have to add to the force you are exerting here to overcome that friction, right? So that's a negative work. But that doesn't make work in a, a vector quantity if it's still a, a scalar quantity. And that's the nature of a dot product. This is why this is the most archetypical example of a dot product. There are many other examples. Like if you were to catch fish in a, in a river with a stream direction like this, and you had a fishing gear like this kind of thing, a net, with a handle, how would you place the, the fishnet in the, in the stream? Perpendicular to the stream, right? If you place it like this, then the fish are smarter than going in this direction into your net, right? And you're reducing the surface area that is visible to the stream, right? So if it's perpendicular, what is perpendicular? That's a very important question. Aren't we talking about this surface here? The surface of this circle. This is a concept that you all know by intuition. If it's a very cold day and there's a bit of sunlight, you would try to kind of orient yourself with your with the surface side of your body towards the sun to, to warm up a little, right? You want to have the most surface area towards the sun, like this. Or if you wanted to have a solar panel being efficiently oriented towards the sun, you want it to be perpendicular to the sunlight. And, or in other words, you want some indicator of the surface to be parallel to the sunlight, almost. What would that indicator be? How would you show the direction of one single surface or a circular surface like this one? Create a vector that uh, lines uh, along the uh, axis of the, the thing you're measuring. Yeah, so, so that, that vector here. is called a normal vector, which is a very useful and important vector. This is, again, a, a flash forward. So you will hear more about it and read more about it in the lecture notes. But here, I just said it anyway. So this kind of these kind of phenomena exist in many places in physics, and they're called fluxes of different sorts, or flows. You you can think about them as flows. Or, or this this one is a I find it the most archetypical example, which is work as the dot product of force and displacement. Okay. So. Let me tell you the good news, which is how to compute these vectors is, well, that this is the long list of applications or tricks where you need dot products, but let me tell you, oops, what did I do? Let me tell you right away that without knowing dot products, you can almost do nothing in computer graphics. Yeah, so they're very, very important. Um, and on the positive side, you can do lots of cool things with them. You can detect perpendicularity. You can detect um, how much of, for instance, solar energy your surface receives just by looking at its orientation and the position of the, the relative position of the sun or the general direction of the sun rays and so on. So it's a very, perhaps the most useful thing that you encounter. And this was only for your intuition, but then more generally speaking, then remember we said that 
we can deal with vectors not as arrows anymore, but we can deal with them as tuples or arrays of numbers, right? Following the concepts um, established by Rene Descartes, right? So since we are dealing with their with their components or coordinates, and since we are referring to these um, kind of principal directions being represented with steps in the direction of X, steps in the direction of Y, steps in the direction of Z, respectively shown with I, J, K coordinates or I, J, K little vectors, then we can also utilize what is known as algebra. We have broken something into down it, into its components, and now we can use algebra to, to expand these products into the, the products between the constituent elements of those things, right? That's in the essence of algebra. And that's in fact, one of the reasons we call this business linear algebra. So what do you think this means here? This description, this humble mathematical description. If A is this big vector, we have described it in terms of a number. Is this a vector, A? It's a scalar. Exactly, so, yeah, this number. is a scalar, but this one is a vector. What do you yeah. think it looks like? It's a unit vector, so um, one, zero, zero. Exactly. So this is a vector. This one is a vector, which is zero, one, zero. And this one is a vector, which is zero, zero, one. Right? So A, B, and C end up being scalars, right? So now if we, if we just do this, say, let, let's figure out what will be the dot product of I and I, J and J, K and K, right? Just following our intuition. So I and I are perfectly aligned with each other. The cosine of theta between them will be one because there's an angle of zero between them, right? So i dot i, j dot j, and k dot k work out to be one, exactly one, pure and simple, right? And therefore, for the same, for the very same reasons, the angle being 90 degrees between i and j, j and i, j and k, k and j, k and i, k, i and k, will be 90 degrees. Therefore, the dot products between all such elements will be zero, right? That's very good news because then if we expand these sums into these kind of um, products, then we can then we can rewrite the dot product in terms of the the, the products of the constituent uh, the corresponding constituent elements of those vectors summed up together. This means that we have a very very fast algorithm computing the dot product between two vectors. Um, so you you given two vectors, you get their coordinates and or their entries or the components, and then you multiply them with each other and then you sum up the, the, the products. And that gives you that product between the two vectors. And interestingly enough, that should also be equal to the lengths of these two vectors multiplied by each other times the cosine of theta. You also know how to compute the lengths of each vector using the Pythagoras equation generalized in 3D, right? So if I asked you what is the most efficient way of computing the angle between two vectors, what would you say? If I were to tell the difference of your general directions in life with respect to food, music, politics, etc., etc., how would I compute that? Maybe you can actually form these vectors and, and tell me about your angle differences, angular differences in life. The answer is on, on the screen, so just tell me how to do it. Could you repeat the first part of the question? Like, how do you calculate the, the angle between two vectors? Is that the question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Using, using the uh, calculation, well, you could, for example, take the dot product. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, divide by uh, the length of A and B, and you would yes. get the cosinus of uh, theta. Yeah, so you get the cosine of theta, and then 
a very interesting fact. There is something called a cosine inverse. But I have given you some idea of what a function is, right? A function is like a function in Python is something that takes in an input and spits out an, an output, right? So it gives you this uh, other number, which is the so-called f of x or the function of that number. So if you have a function called cosine of theta, for some functions, there exists another function that could give you the reverse operation. So if you have a function that could get cosine of theta, and give you theta itself, that would be a function that could answer the question, what was the angle for which the cosine was equal to zero, for instance? What would you say? What would that angle be? 90 degrees, 270 degrees, and so on and so forth, right? So though for those angles, the, the, the answer to the cosine of theta will be zero, right? So this other function is called arc cosine or cosine inverse. So assume that you have this function. Given the cosine of theta, it will tell you what is theta, right? So then Sander already gave the answer, but, but just tell me how practically you will do it. So if you formed these vectors. Um. Where you could take the, the, the x, y, and z values of each factors and multiply by them, by them to themselves uh, and add, add them up. Yeah. Uh, and you would, you would get the dot product of the vector a and b in this case. Uh, and if you wanted to know the lengths of each vector, you could use the Pythagoras' theorem, but then for a three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And I don't see a problem with extending this to 12 dimensions. Do you see any problem? No. Okay, Just, so uh, then congratulations, we have generalized the definition of angle between two vectors in higher dimensions. And then we can have some concepts like um, that we are aligned in, in our directions in life and we only have a difference like, I don't know, 10 degrees. It sounds a bit funny because we are talking about the 12 dimensional vectors. We could also end up having like something close to 180 degrees of difference in our directions in life, right? And we can compute that mathematically. And that's actually something that is called the cosine distance between vectors. And it's actually used in artificial intelligence. So it's a very useful concept. So as I said, th these are some of the nice things about mathematics. They usually nicely generalize to higher dimensions, provided that we started with uh, like solid enough definitions, they can oftentimes generalize rather easily to higher dimensions and more complex situations, yeah? And this should be the good news that that product can be computed so easily without actually using a protractor, without measuring the angle between those things. In fact, it's the other way around. So we can compute the dot product very quickly using this kind of a function. So you can think of a function that takes in two vectors as two sets of coordinates, putting out the dot product as a single scalar number. Just like that, you can you can actually do it very quickly with Python, right? And so I think this is um, maybe where I should stop because we need a break and the other lectures are starting. But if, if you have questions, I'm um, more than happy to answer questions. There are still a few more very important concepts such as the cross product and the locus of points on, on planes and orientation. Um, we talked a little bit about planes in, in another break. And since the whole thing is recorded, you have access to that. I think I've written enough about these ones and there's something about intersections and transformations that, that you can read from the lecture notes, if you don't mind, right? We have to save time for more, um, more lectures and more workshops. Um, and yeah, there's always room for improvement in these lectures, but the, the subject area is so vast that it, it is always a mission impossible to squeeze it in into two hours. So I hope you didn't mind that uh, there was a bit of jumping around one concept to another, but these are like the most fundamental concepts that I
um, would like to convey before you get into the details, right? And the most important one of those is that you need to disassociate images from the concepts and information con contents of data models. That vectors are not arrows, in fact, they're like multi-dimensional arrays of points or yeah, single dimensional arrays of points like uh, arrays of numbers like these ones. The notation here in these slides is not perfect. The, the one in the lecture notes is, is the leading one. As I said, these are, yeah, general concepts. Sometimes the notations in different sources that you will encounter are not perfect. So you also have to get used to coming up with the clear notation by yourself. That's why I also bothered with uh, terminologies. So, okay, then I have to really stop and answer questions. 